going to speak. So I'm Robbie. I work for the New York Times. Uh, I write about the Southeast and do research here in Atlanta. This is my Facebook page for the day. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the surprising, I think exciting ways that we at the New York Times are using social media to find and tell better stories. Um, first of all, I just wanted to make clear, I'm not officially representing the New York Times. I'm just here uh, on my own as somebody who's interested in the future of journalism. Um, that said, I'll take you a little bit through the history of the New York Times um, and what we are doing to bring you the news uh, on new platforms. So when Facebook unveiled its new timeline feature earlier this year, the Times created this really cool uh, program that walks you through the history of the paper. This is the first paper that was ever made in 1851. Uh, and we will zoom ahead to 1996. And I mentioned 1996 because that is when the Times created its first website, uh, nytimes.com. And I'd basically like to argue that in the past 16 years since that happened, what we do in journalism has changed more than it did in the previous 150 years. Um, and that as technology accelerates the way that we bring you news, uh, it's also changing the way that, um, not only the way that you, you receive the news, but also the way that we report the news. That means there are far more ways than there ever were for you to read the New York Times. There's the print edition, which about 1.2 million people subscribe to every weekday, 1.6 on Sunday. There's our website, which gets about 44 million visitors every month. Any device that can be used for reading news has a, a mobile version, a, uh, a digital version of the New York Times available for it. There's one of my favorite programs called Times Reader that essentially replicates the experience of reading the print paper, but in a digital format, all the way down to doing the crossword. Um, this is actually a device that the Times has in testing. It is basically a coffee table that you could use to share the paper in a digital format. So it works sort of like a giant iPad. So in the way that you might pass somebody a section of the print paper, you could just slide them that section. Uh, on this device. And then there's one of our fastest growing ways to get the news, which is our social media properties. Every section of the paper, every reporter has a Twitter account, has a Facebook page. The main New York Times Twitter account has almost 5 million followers. Our Facebook uh, page has about 2.1 million fans. But let's take a look not only at the new ways that we're bringing the, you the news, which you're probably familiar with, but the new ways in which we're reporting the news. Um, social media is set up for people to tell their own stories, which is a remarkable tool, not only for the people who are doing the telling, but also for those of us who gather news. Um, there are, we're coming up on one billion people who are on Facebook, which is really an incredible thing. I mean, think about that. One seventh of the planet in one place all telling their stories. And so if you're in the business of gathering those stories, analyzing them, contextualizing it, you have, for the first time ever, all of these stories gathered in one place in real time with a digital record. So what does that mean for what we do? Let's take a very simple example. Uh, so last fall, the Braves had a terrible season. Uh, we were in the lead for the wild card race, and we blew it. And so we wanted to put together a story for the paper um, about the Braves and about the Boston Red Sox kind of falling apart at the last minute. So one of the things we needed to do for that story was go out and find Braves fans and talk to them about how agonizing it must be to watch your team implode like this. In the past, what we would have done is we would have called people. We would have gone down to, the, to Turner Field and talked to people uh, down there. And we still do that. So I went down to Turner Field and talked to fans there. But before I did, I did this, which is I put out a call on Facebook for Braves fans. I said, we're writing this story. Um, if you know somebody who's a diehard Braves fan who can talk to us in a vivid way about what it's like to be a fan, we'd like to talk to them. And you can see how quickly we got the responses that we needed. So in five minutes, we got our first name. In 15 minutes, we have four responses. Not all of them are helpful. My friend Greg wrote, Go Giants, in all capital letters. <laughs> um, in a couple of hours, we filled up the screen. And by the next morning, we have the story. And you can see some of the people that were interviewed in that came directly from this Facebook call. Um, 
So this guy named Hill Peterson, who I've never met, I talked to on the phone, he knows someone who I know, um, gave us what was a really good quote. He said, what would sports be without choking? You've got to give people something to bite their nails about. Um, let's take another example. So there was a prison strike last year in Georgia uh, in a bunch of different prisons. The inmates decided to go on strike over their living conditions. Um, and they actually called us. There have always been illegal cell phones in prison, but these days they are illegal smartphones, which means they have the internet. So we were talking to these people about the strike and how they were coordinating it and what was going on, and they mentioned that they had Facebook pages as inmates. They were under fake names, um, but they had Facebook pages, and they were using them to disseminate information to their friends and family about what was going on inside the prison. And so we friended them. And while other news organizations were relying on you know, statements from the prison, we were getting it directly from the inmates themselves. And that actually ended up being the story. We ended up doing a story about how these guys are using the same technology that all of us are to stay in touch with their friends and family, even from inside jail. All right, a third example. And this just goes to show you how essentially anything you are looking for you can find on a social network. One of the amazing things is people organize themselves into groups by interest, by certain characteristics. And so if you're looking for a certain feature, if you're looking for a certain type of person, you can find them online. They have self-identified. So this is a story that I did for the public radio show, This American Life. Um, again, it came from an article I read in a local newspaper, but I felt like you weren't getting the most interesting story uh, from, from the local coverage. This is, a, this is a really amazing story. This is a story about a group of police officers that spent a year in high school pretending to be students. They went to class every day, they took the tests, they even took the standardized tests, they went to recess, and the whole thing was a mission to catch drug dealers in the school. So at the end of the year, they arrested 31 students for selling drugs. Um, the local coverage was entirely based on the police's account, and I felt like there really would be a fascinating story and what it must be like to be a student and to realize that one of your classmates actually wasn't your age, but was an undercover police officer. Um, so I flew down to Florida. The police wouldn't allow us to visit the school. Most of the students were still in jail. If they'd been arrested, their parents didn't want to talk to us. So what we did was we went to the Facebook page for the high school. Every high school has a Facebook page. It's essentially a digital version of the playground. It's where people talk about what's going on in school. And so obviously people were talking about this. So we went to the Park Vista Community High School. You can see I'm going back in time to when this happened. Um, and literally, I searched for the word undercover. And in searching for the word undercover, I found all of these people who were talking about all of the arrests. And there's 60 people who have liked this. Eight people had commented on it. And so we messaged them and we said, we'd like to get your side of what happened. We're curious how students feel about this operation. Out of that, we met this guy. This is Justin, and he ended up being the main character in the story. So Justin knew one of the undercover cops because he had a crush on her. He thought he was, she was a regular student, and he invited her to prom. He serenaded her in front of his entire class, and when she asked him to buy her pot, he, bought, he got her $20 worth of pot and gave it to her, he says, because he had a crush on her. Um, that ended up being our story, and I think it's a much more interesting story than had we solely relied on the police's account of what happened. Are there risks to doing journalism this way? This is not a traditional way to find stories, and there are, are certainly precautions that you have to take. Uh, one of them is people's privacy. I think there's a clear difference between public figures and ordinary citizens. And ordinary citizens don't think that what they post on the internet might end up in a newspaper. And so if you are going to use it, you have to be very frank with the person. And I think, I think depending on the circumstance, you need to make sure you get their buy-in to make sure that, that they're comfortable with you sharing this information with a larger audience. Um, you also need to be aware that what you're doing is very public. If you are working against competitor news organizations and you make your Facebook status the story that you're working on, they will know what you're working on and you may be showing too much of your hand. Um, so you need to be careful what stories you do that with. Um, the bottom line is there is no replacement for old-fashioned journalism. Um, these tools are supplemental. They are not a replacement. This is a foreign correspondent for the Times named Anthony Shadid, and he's a two-time Pulitzer winner, very famous for going to dangerous parts of the Middle East reporting stories. And he died last year on a reporting assignment in Syria. And in one of the stories about his death, 
the editor of the New York Times was quoted as saying, what made Shadid remarkable could be summed up in three words, which was, he always went. So these tools are supplemental, but the bottom line is you need to be willing to always go. That said, I don't think these precautions are reason enough for people to not use these incredible tools that are at our disposal. Um, Facebook has said that its mission is to make is to provide technology so that people can tell the story of their life in real time. And if you're in the business of finding great stories, that's a remarkable asset. So being able to sift through this incredible amount of data, find the most interesting stories, contextualize them, analyze them, use traditional reporting to supplement them, um, you know, you'd, you'd really have to be a fool not to use these, use these technologies that are at your disposal. Um, so in the spirit of using social media, this is a post that I made on the TEDx conference earlier this week, and I asked people what questions they had about these topics, what they wanted to hear. Uh, and I want to focus on one question that we got from a guy named Ryan Christensen. I don't know if Ryan is here. Um, Ryan asked what I thought was a really thoughtful question, and I'll paraphrase. Essentially what Ryan said is, how is what journalists, how is what journalists do changing because of Twitter and Facebook, and how is their relationship with sources changing? I think the answer is that news is getting much more collaborative. We've always relied on sources, but we're doing it in new ways. Um, and so the takeaway to me is that you are all part of a giant experiment. You're all part of an experiment in storytelling. And our job should be to call the best of your stories the most interesting stories and bring them to a larger audience. And these technologies can really help us do that, but we can only do it with your collaboration. And I'd like to open it up to regular questions, and thank you all for coming. Well, thank you. Uh, the question I, I would have is, is how reliable is